We'll give a few more minutes for people to join, but welcome everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when, where you're all joining. It is wonderful to see so many of you from all over the world celebrating International Youth Day with us. Great. So my name is Monica Ferrey, and I'll be the MC for today's event, Celebrating Progress and Partnership with Youth. That being said, let's get this celebration started. Our speakers are joining us from 10 different countries and include USAID Washington and mission-based staff, implementing partners, and of course, young people from all around the world. They will highlight some of the ways they're working to bring our commitments to young people's well-being and inclusion to life. Through the agenda, they will also reflect on the lessons learned as we grow our efforts to engage diverse young people as partners in USAID's programs and policies. As someone who is interested in improving my community and who served on USAID's yp 2 Youth Advisor Group, I am really looking forward to all these discussions because it has been precisely this kinds of spaces that where I was able to exchange ideas on making youth programming more inclusive, meaningful, and effective. Today's agenda will begin with fire chat, fireside chat led by USAID's agency youth coordinator, Sarah Sladen, and include speakers from USAID Rwanda and Burundi, yp 2 and Youth Excel. Next, we will hear two spark talks from youth advisors and POCs from USAID Zimbabwe and USAID North Macedonia. After the spark talks, we will be joined by yp 2 youth partners from Haiti, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Tunisia for our Youth at the Forefront panel. Our speakers will be discussing how their experiences with yp 2 have informed their views on the meaning of partnership and their ideas on how we can strengthen partnerships with young people in our development efforts going forward. Finally, to close today's event, we will hear from USA Deputy Assistant Administrator Bama Azraya, who leads the agency's Inclusive Development Hub in the Borough for Inclusive Growth Partnerships and Innovation. So finally, to kick us off, I'm pleased to introduce USAID Agency Youth Coordinator, Sarah Sladen. Sarah oversees the advancement of USAID's youth and development policy and supports the agency's efforts to expand young people's access and participation in the services, practices, and policies that impact their lives. Sarah, please, the floor is all yours. <laughs> Thank you, Monica, and thanks to everyone for joining us in celebration of International Youth Day. It's great to see you all. This IYD marks two years since USAID launched our updated youth in development policy, which is guided by a commitment to engaging youth as partners in development. It's also the final year of USAID's Youth Power 2 Learning and Evaluation Activity, or YP2LE for short. YP2LE, together with our continuing activity, Youth Excel, have been instrumental in developing USAID's positive youth development framework and evidence base, and our efforts to integrate youth engagement in USAID's programs. So this IYD is a timely moment to pause and reflect on our commitments to engaging diverse young people as partners in achieving development progress, and why taking this approach in all aspects of our work is so important. As youth coordinator, a key question for me and my team is also how, how do we put this vision into practice as a government agency, as implementing partners, and with young people? What knowledge, tools, and resources are needed? What have we learned so far from our failures, from our successes, and critically from what young people are telling us? So with me to reflect on some of these questions is Keisha Epiom, Mission Director of USA's Rwanda and Burundi Missions, Nicola Shehade, Senior Specialist for Mental Health and Inclusion at Making Sense International, and an advisor to YP2LE, and Zyra Linus Carrasco, Global Jesse Officer with USAID's Youth Excel activity implemented by our partner IREX. Keisha, Nicole, and Zyra, thank you so much for joining us from Rwanda, Malawi, and Washington, D.C. today. It's really great to see you all. Keisha, let me turn to you first. The USAID, Rwanda, and Burundi missions have emerged as leaders in youth programming. And in Rwanda, for example, you're working closely with the government, with civil society and communities to advance youth well-being and inclusion across a range of sectors from health to economic growth, education and democracy and governance. 
And so as a mission director for not one, but two locations, and with so many competing priorities and challenges to address, why is youth the priority for your mission? Over to you. Thank you so much, Sarah. And let me start the conversation with today is day one for me as mission director for USA Rwanda and Burundi. Um, I just got back. I was sworn in July 18th, but I was actually the deputy mission director for the last two years. So this is day one for me. Um, but I would say youth are a majority, a major priority for us in both Rwanda and Burundi. And I know we only have a limited time today, so I'm going to focus on our Rwanda portfolio and hope that at a next event or any other time we can discuss the very special approach that we have and the impact of our work and our social cohesion, economic empowerment, mental health and education for Burundi and youth. So with that, as I said, I'll focus on the Rwanda portfolio, but we have a total population of 13.6 million and almost 70% of Rwanda's population is under the age of 30. This number is going to continue to grow. Youth between the ages of 15 and 24 are expected to make up about 43% of the total Rwanda population by 2050. So the Youth Bulge is a tremendous opportunity for transformative development work. This presents us with a challenge. In line with our USA Global Mission, calling on us to help ensure that all young people are socially protected and able to make meaningful contributions to their society. So positive youth development is a critical is critical for Rwanda's success. The president has a vision of 2035, um, with it becoming Rwanda becoming an upper middle income country, and then eventually by 2050, a high income country. So youth employment is among the top priorities that the government has and that USAID shares with it being a priority. Despite it being a priority, though, we have some data that is pretty worrisome. There's been a steady increase of youth unemployment. So over the past five years, it went up by over 36%, which is concerning. Currently, one in four Rwandan youth between the ages of 15 and 24 are actively looking for work and are, are unemployed. There is good news. We are making strides to improve this. So graduates of one of our USAID-funded programs, Akazi Kanozi, the workforce readiness program that we've completed reported income nearly twice the natural average. So when you compare the experiences from before and after participating in our workforce readiness program, young people's earnings increased by an average of 225%, particularly among the very poor. Another key priority for us is fighting against gender-based violence. While there is strong political will for women's empowerment in Rwanda, Harmful social norms continue to endanger adolescent girls and young women. So let me talk about 2023. 23% of Rwandan women between the ages of 20 and 24 reported having experienced sexual violence. Rwanda's context is unique. It is a country that is still healing from the 1994 genocide. It runs through everything. So the effects of, our pro of all of our programming requires thoughtful, empathetic adjustments to interventions. The lingering intergenerational trauma from the genocide impacts youth of all genders. So to strategically address this, USAID has several interventions in progress. We have a youth working group that's championing, championing a multi-sectorial approach to prevent and mitigate teenage pregnancy and gender-based violence, which we intend to integrate into our next CDCS, which is coming up now. We're coming to the end of our current CDCS. We're getting ready to develop our new five-year strategy. Our health team is working with five local partners and host government stakeholders on community-based mental health and psychological, so, 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 social, social, psychosocial, sorry, support toolkit that can be used to facilitate dialogues about mental health and well-being and community settings. So our results will set the path forward and determine how we continue on our path. Our approach is comprehensive, helping youth in a very practical, tangible, tangible ways, helping them take control of their life, their health, and their future. So thanks to our programming, youth are receiving sexual and reproductive health and rights training, life skills, mentoring, mentorship programs, positive parenting, 
education subsidies, economic strengthening, HIV and gender-based violence prevention and response, HIV testing services, and psychosocial support. We cannot afford for our youth to not be a priority for us in Rwanda. The country right now is, they are the present, they are our fu in the future, and it depends on Rwanda's success, that we have good or excellent positive youth development. Thank you so much, Keisha. I'm always happy when I hear a mission director talking about youth integration into the CDCS. It's very encouraging. Um, but you've also mentioned a couple of other cross-cutting issues, including mental health, psychosocial support, trauma-informed approaches, and we'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, but you've also touched on the fact that all of us work and live in incredibly complex systems. And it's one of the many reasons why forging strong and diverse partnerships at every level of our work is so important. And for USA, this includes engaging and partnering with youth and youth-led organizations. And this is something that I know USA Rwanda is doing across the country. And so I wanted to ask you, how do these experiences engaging directly with young Rwandans inform your thinking about how USAID approaches partnerships or other agency priorities like localization or inclusive development? Keisha. In Rwanda, the government is willing to partner with youth, of, youth across every sector. So that is a huge benefit for us and a way for us to dive in and really partner with the government. We see this with youth and political appointees serving at the highest level of government ministries and state agencies. I know going to certain ministries, I can see someone who is, I consider myself young. You know, at least I would like to, my kids don't think so, but I consider myself young and see to have to engage in conversations strategically about where Rwanda is going and know that they're in this age gap where we are considered young is really empowering to see. It's our responsibility as at USA to leverage that, leverage it internally through our internship programs and externally by crafting activities that incorporate our youth. So for example, we hosted a positive youth development training for our staff and implementing partners. Inspired by these conversations and the learning that happened at this event, we kicked off a youth community of practice with the staff of our implementing partners, which is helping to improve youth engagement, within our ongoing activities. A Rwandan youth who works for one of our implemented partners is leading this new group. We're already seeing good results of this approach. This enables us, for example, to identify a skill gap with some of youth private operators in the water supply sector that we engage through our project called Isoko oh, Ubuzima. <laughs> Excuse my Kenya Rwandan, which really means the source of life. The Water and Sanitation Corporation in Rwanda contracts youth-led operators for rural water management as a way of bringing young people into the sector and increasing youth employment. To help bridge a skill gap and help the entire initiative succeed, USAID Source of Life trains youth private operators and business plans in water system management so that they can ensure the quality provision of clean water services countrywide especially in rural areas. In addition to this, we have a very active localization working group at USA Rwanda. Members come from many offices and each bring a different lens and experience. This group is currently actively creating new pathways for direct awards to youth-led organizations in, in the near future. Here at USA Rwanda, we've already reached the 2025 agency goal for localization, so that is great. In order for us to since we've reached that goal, we want to take it a step further. So earlier this year, we completed a comprehensive partner landscape assessment that gave us a good look at all the local organizations in Rwanda. We specifically look for youth-led, youth-focused, and youth-relevant organizations. And now we're in the process of combing through this data, crafting approaches to bring some new youth organizations into our family of implementing partners here. So as you see, we have a multi-pronged approach to youth development, anchored in positive youth development policy and adapted to the local context. Again, as I stated, youth, they're our future. They have to be at the forefront of our thought process and our action. I really do believe that youth have to be a priority in our next CDCS. 
which we're in the process of creating as we speak. They will have a seat at the table. Thank you so much, Keisha. I really appreciate how you've connected the localization agenda with youth-led organizations and some of your efforts to map and engage those organizations. And I know we'd love to have you back for a youth core to take a deeper dive into what you learned through that process so other missions can kind of learn from, from that approach and that model. Um, and thank you also for joining us for this event on day one of your role as mission director. Really, really appreciate that. And I'm glad to have you here. So we're here to reflect on what we're learning. We've heard a little bit about that from, from you, Keisha. Um, I think another clear lesson as we've sought to engage youth more directly in our work is the importance of our own individual and organizational readiness to do so, especially when it comes to issues like inclusion, shared decision-making, safeguarding, and protection. And that's why in 2022, we partnered with YP2LE and Youth Excel to develop USAID's new meaningful and inclusive youth engagement workshop. And Zyra and Nicola, you both have been key contributors and trainers as we've piloted this workshop with mission staff and partners in places like Ghana, Guatemala, and just this week in Malawi, where you are joining us from, Zyra. And so Zyra, Keisha told us about the importance of youth engagement, and I wanted to ask you, reflecting on your experience with Youth Excel, which is a global mechanism that includes in its consortia youth-led organizations, and as a trainer in youth engagement, what are some things that USAID staff and implementing partners need to know and practice more in our own work when it comes to youth engagement? Zyra, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sara, for inviting us to be here and for raising this question. Uh, so first, I would like to start by saying a little bit about why we found that constant and intentional focus on meaningful youth engagement is absolutely critical to meeting uh, the program goals. We know that many youth programs, many, many programs are focused on youth and they do engage youth. But the thing is that without attention to meaningful engagement, these programs may accident accidentally be in tokenism engagement. Um, for example, we've heard from some youth that have worked in, in Youth Excel telling us that uh, if you want to avoid tokenism, take our feedback and do something about it. You know, it's, it's a line there between consultation, you can... Uh, say a lot about that you consulted youth, but then do nothing about it. So it's really important to put attention on those details. Um, without attention to inclusive engagement, these programs may also engage only the elite youth or the usual suspects. In these cases, our good intentions for youth engagement may end up in resulting in more distrust, more community division, or a sense of injustice. And of course, we'll not have the, the effect of offering more effective and relevant youth programs in the sectors where we work. So when I think about your question, Sara, what do we need to know and what do we need to do? Um, some of the things that come to my mind are the following. So first, um, there are still so many barriers to meaningful and inclusive youth engagement that we face as youth champions. These, these barriers are um, perceptions that sufficient time are, and money are not available to support youth engagement. But we've seen even in this workshop this week, while we've been discussing with uh, a lot of great participants, when we, when we, um, when we reflect on the, in the program cycle, how can we build all time in advance if we have the intention. Um, another barrier is social and cultural norms that tell us that young people and especially certain identity groups are not able to meaningfully contribute to local or national, national solutions. And the last barrier is um, how certain expectations that we as decision makers have of how youth should contribute. Um, that they should immediately understand the technical language we use, all this jargon we have in USAID, or advanced statistical analysis, for example, or even that they should participate well when they are doing it in their second or third language. Um, a second thought that I would like to share is that without considering youth protection, there cannot be meaningful, inclusive youth engagement. 
I know that we don't have time again uh, for this deep conversation today, but I do really want to share that applying a youth protection policy across all of our work and ensuring that all partners have access to financial resources in their subgrants to support protection, it has been transformational for youth excel. We must do better on ensuring that youth protection support and resources are, are built into all of our work. Um, fine, uh, the third thought is we must remember that we, and, and I really like this phrase, we don't know what we don't know. And that the only way to change this is to constantly intentionally build trust and create a space to be, to be told what we are doing wrong and to respond with openness and empathy when we are told to do this. And we've been reflecting this week um, with this group and other groups about communication with empathy, building soft skills around all this. And finally, my last contribution is that we must all find ways to advocate for the time, resources, and support for meaningful youth engagement. And to remember that without it, we will not have the most effective development programs. We must be creative and innovative and push others to create the time, space, and money that we need. Thank you so much, Saira. I really appreciate you, you touched on, I think, two larger themes. And one is around accountability and feedback loops. We've been doing a lot more consultation and direct engagement with young people. We've also been trying to reach more deeply into communities where we haven't traditionally been as successful at engaging the most marginalized youth populations. But then there's a sense of what do you do with this information and how are you accountable to these communities where we're asking for feedback or to share. Um, and so there's a sense of accountability that is connected to building trust with young people. Um, and the other piece that I really appreciate is that you've started to connect the both the kind of interpersonal, the cultural and the structural barriers that are in the way of youth engagement to program cycle, to implementation, to the things that we can practically build in to our approaches across the program cycle, including in our budgets and our timelines to do youth engagement in a way that is meaningful and inclusive. And that leads to better development, better program design and better impact. So thank you so much for sharing your perspectives from the training. And it's always been, it's been such a pleasure to train with you. And likewise, Nicola, you know, as we train staff and partners, I wanted to come to you with a similar question and in particular acknowledge the expertise that you've brought to this workshop as a mental health specialist who's helped us to integrate a focus on safeguarding, inclusion, protection, and trauma-informed approaches. You brought so much to this training. So I wanted to ask you, why, why do you think attention to these issues in particular are important, not just in the training, but how do they connect to our wider youth development and youth engagement efforts? Nicola, over to you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. I um, uh, just want to say thank you for this opportunity, and I'm happy to be here in this discussion. I... Uh, what I will say is just link what my colleagues on this call said. So I'm building off on what Keisha and Zaira already uh, mentioned in a way, the importance of integrating trauma-informed approaches and safeguarding into a meaningful and inclusive youth engagement workshop is because without understanding the underlying factors of what might uh, stop someone from engaging with us, i.e. maybe youth, certain groups, without understanding how to create these safe spaces, these enabling spaces, um, or the practical know-how of uh, how to create this uh, these feedback loops or communication or improve our empathetic learning and communication, we're not going to be able to sustain the effects of meaningful and inclusive youth engagement for the longer term. That's one. And we're not going to be able to uh, keep this engagement consistent across the program cycle if we want to do this again in a, a similar manner. And we're not going to be able, and th a third point about that is that we're not, we might pro most probably not be able to engage all the youth from different groups. It's important that it, these kind of tools, a trauma-informed approach or a safeguarding approach would help us tailor our approach to the different groups and their different interests and needs. I'm going to delve deeper into the details of what that means. Um, and why this is important. First and foremost, mental health and trauma in most of the cases are hidden and not visible. We cannot see if someone, we cannot know all the lived experiences, all the stressors that someone faces, 
and all the, the different systematic discrimination that they face depending on their groups. That being said, the toll and the weight of these experiences will affect our well-being and our mental health. In some cases, this will impact us in a uh, in the same way a traumatic incident or experience will impact our our brains and our well-being. So this as a premise will not me interacting with youth or us interacting with different youth groups, we don't know this from the get-go. We don't know who's facing what. So that's important to keep in mind. Why? Because we're not telling you or telling us to be psychologists or therapists in our work. What we're telling us uh, and we're t- what we're telling ourselves is exactly what Zaira mentioned. We don't know what we do not know. Exactly this. And because we don't know what we do not know, it's important to just adopt this approach where we focus on empathy focus on openness, on transparency, on building trust and safety, and on increasing agency and resilience, no matter what the lived experience is. Second, uh, the trauma-informed approach and the positive youth development approach, they they really overlap. Sometimes use different words, but we qualify the same practice. So for example, uh, the PYD approach focusing on assets, uh, on agency, uh, really aligns with the principles of a trauma-informed approach focusing on increasing resilience, increasing agency, increasing contribution and collaboration within the youth and within the youth groups. Um, both approach, both approaches focuses on creating an enabling environment where the youth will be able to provide their feedback, provide their uh, speak up, provide their perspective, as long as we know how to deal with that perspective. This is the second important, important part. An enabling environment is not only creating the space for speaking up, it's only knowing how to deal with that feedback once they speak up. And that is all that also ties up to the point where to the point around feedback loop and communicating to the user how we can deal with their feedback or what we can do with that feedback. Uh, both approaches will focus on promoting uh, uh, promoting the Safeguarding principles. What we mean by safeguarding is preve- is not only a response to protect protection issues, but also a preventative approach. So looking ahead, how can we prevent harm from happening again? And prevent harm prevention uh, also falls under the do no harm principle that both the that the mental health approach, the mental health position paper within USAID that the different toolkits that Waputali worked on with uh, the Meaningful youth, Inclusive Youth Engagement Workshop, the tool, Mental Health Toolkit for Marginalized Groups, and the toolkit, Psychosocial Toolkit for Youth focuses on. Um, additionally, uh, both approaches focus on increasing leadership. Once you focus on increasing leadership and agency within the youth, what, does, what that uh, means is that uh, they, like, they can start First of all, they can start being more responsible regarding their own decision and the community, and they can start becoming change agents within their own communities and groups back home, even if we cannot be present in these own communities. I know recognizing the time, I will be wrapping up now my response and over to you, Sarah, for more questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicola. I wish we had another hour to dive deeply into this issue, but I think what you're speaking to so well is that We know these are issues that need to be addressed. We see this everywhere we work with young people who've been impacted by violence, by conflict. It's not always visible. I think Keisha really uh, touched on that right at the beginning. She's talking about working in the context of Rwanda, coming out of a genocide and rebuilding, and this piece around intergenerational engagement. And you're talking about the kinds of tools and approaches that we as development practitioners can start to practice to build into our programs And where we're doing that, seeing real returns on those investments, that we can get better outcomes for young people, even incrementally when we start to focus on mental health and youth well-being and inclusion. So thank you so much for sharing some of the the insights you brought to the training. Um, I know we're at time, and I have just one last question, and I'm going to be an unfair moderator and ask you all to take just one minute to respond to a large question. So apologies in advance, but I think it's important because we've made progress in youth development over the last decade, I think we can say that. And the world has changed enormously in that time with new challenges and opportunities emerging every day that are impacting young people's prospects and well being. So, for each of you, from where you sit, what would progress for youth development look like for you 
and what is needed for us to get there in just a few words. So Zyra, let me start with you and then I'll go to you, Nicola, and then end with you, Keisha. Zyra. So for me, working from Guatemala for an international NGO with USA funds, but also be very close to the young participants and the local organizations that are implementing. Uh, true progress for youth, look for me, looks like change in attitudes and behaviors of decision makers at different levels within the development system. This change implies avoiding treating the issue of youth as an indicator, as numbers, and as the object of our reports, and instead seeing youth as human beings in their complexity. Our decisions should reflect that, how we are contributing to the lives of youth, but also to, to the local organizations if, uh, if they are youth-led or youth-serving organizations that make the wor that work possible. And I want to highlight that we are all partners in this. And what we need to get there is we need to be the voice that insists that even within a rigid system, we can be flexible and that if there is a will, things can be done differently. We need to be willing to take risks. We may fail but in doing so, we learn and improve how to meet youth needs better. So let's be ready to fail. Uh, to do that, adults in decision-making position must be willing to step out of their comfort zone, take risks, listen, and dare to have uncomfortable conversations to learn new things and practice new things. Thank you. Thank you, Zyra. Nicola. Um, I, I think the... The, some of the important points I can focus on now is the importance of integrating mental health. So across sectoral approaches is really important. We cannot do one, we cannot do everything on our own. It's important to collaborate. It's important to partner and it's important to, important to localize our efforts into integrating mental health because mental health is very contextual and cultural. It differs from one place to another. Safeguarding also differs from one place to another in the understanding of the concepts. Second, it's important to have it's important to demystify mental health, demystify safeguarding for not technical pe people. What does that mean is that we're not offering treatment, we're offering a safe space, a preventative space or a space to respond uh, adequately to protection issues or mental health issues. And third, something that also Zara touched upon is bias from the different levels. And not only bias from the different levels, it's important, and we've seen that in the Guatemala workshop, the Meaningful Inclusive Youth Engagement Workshop, leadership buy-in is really important because each one of us in different level in our positionality, in our roles, have a role and have a task to play in increasing youth engagement, championing youth engagement, but also I'm going to add to that championing mental health and the importance of well-being and resilience. Thank you, Nicola. And final word to you, Keisha, please. So I was just listening to my colleagues and if I had a word for it, there's some things that would come up, some common things, leadership, demystifying information, flexible learning, cross-sectorial approach, importance, mental health, change agents. So with that, I would say we have to be on the same page when we talk to our partners about what positive youth development means. For too long, youth have been considered as beneficiaries, somewhat passive recipients of what we designed for them, and we need to change that mindset and put youth in the driver's seat. So what would true progress, progress look like to me? Well, first and foremost, with youth being in the driver's seat, it's what does progress look like to them? And the image that I think, I would, I think they would see is youth organizations driving interventions that most severely impact the lives of youth in Rwanda. Right now, we're talking about unemployment, teenage pregnancy, and mental health. This way, with youth driving the problems and youth leading the change in these problems, they are most affected by the issues and will be empowered and supported as they tackle the problems and create a better and more prosperous future. I think that's a great place to end today's discussion. Great note. And I want to thank you all again, Zyra, Nicola, and Keisha for joining us from Rwanda, from Malawi, from Washington, D.C., I know it's late, getting late for you, Zyra and Keisha. Thank you so much again. This is a great discussion, and I hope we can have you back. Monica, back to you. Great. 
Thank you so much, Sarah, Keisha, Sarah, and Nicola for uh, such a wonderful first session for today's event. It is very refreshing to hear about the steps USAID and implementing partners are taking to ensure youth uh, are partners in development and what we have been learning along the way. Just a quick reminder to please add your name and where you're all joining us from. I've been noting we have attendees from Mozambique, Uzbekistan, South Sudan, Burkina Faso, the Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, Cameroon. So it's really, really exciting to have such a great diversity of countries being represented here today. We are also sharing resources and information in the chat as our speakers talk, so please check them out. So now let's hear from some people putting all these steps to include youth in development into action. We will kick off our Spark Talks with Vusha Shoko. He is the co-lead for the USA Zimbabwe's Youth Development Objective 2 and the program coordinator for the Missions Internship Program. Bushe, over to you. Thank you, Monica. If I may have the slides up, please. Hey, everyone, please confirm you can see my screen. Yes. All right. Thank you. So in September of 2023, USA Zimbabwe uh, launched this internship program uh, in partnership with a local implementing partner. Uh, the purpose being to expand professional and personal growth opportunities for young people uh, and to put youths in the driver's seat. The goal of this program is to provide professional and educational opportunities to third-year students uh, who are enrolled at local universities uh, to enhance their skills and expand their professional opportunities. So to help you understand the Zimbabwean context, uh, most university degrees here are mostly four years in length. And for a student to graduate, uh, they are required to take the first two years at college. Then they spend the third year on an industrial attachment or internship uh, before returning to college to finish their final year. So this group of uh, third year students is our target uh, for this uh, internship program. So for them to complete their program, they are required to do a minimum of eight months but if, can, if they can go all the way to a year of internship, that would be great. So the duration uh, of this internship, uh, we just try to target the minimum eight months required uh, by local universities in Zimbabwe. So it ran from uh, January this year, and we have these interns until uh, the end of September uh, this month. So our internship, how it's structured, we had a total of three phases. Uh, so during the first phase, we had a call for applications. And uh, despite having the call for applications out for just slightly uh, under two weeks, we had over 700 applications, uh, which we received in that short period. And after receiving the 700, we started the screening and selection process. Uh, which screened the 700 down to 100 uh, applicants. So during this uh, screening process, we had some DIA considerations we are looking at, mostly to do with diversity and equity. So we're looking at applicants from all backgrounds. Uh, so we just encourage everyone to apply. We also looked at uh, inclusion and accessibility where we use various platforms uh, to receive applications. So we were on social media, we used email, we had in-person submissions, referrals. So we just tried to reach out through our implementing partners to as many potential applicants as we could. So from that, uh, we moved on to the phase two, which was the career planning uh, and employment preparation uh, workshops, uh, which was facilitated by, by the implementing partner as well. So we had uh, two full day workshops uh, for the selected interns and each uh, of the workshop uh, workshops had a maximum of 50 uh, attendees. So some of the topics we covered uh, during these workshops were career planning and setting career developmental goals, uh, career and job market search, 
digital trends on social media for careers. We looked at developing social media and professional networks, how to create CVs. We looked at career man management tactics. Uh, and also with consultations with some established care professionals uh, in the industry uh, for the Indians. Then we also moved uh, to the phase three uh, of the internship program, which was the selection and interview process. So for this, we had uh, written exercises for all the 100 selected interns. Then this was followed by oral interviews uh, for these interns as well. So this was a combination of implementing partner and USAID internal staff uh, being part of the evaluation committees uh, for this selection for both written and USAID staff also participated in some of the oral interviews, but mostly this was done by the implementing partner. Uh, finally, uh, the implementing partner gave us a short list uh, of eight successful applicants from these interviews. Uh, which then went through the uh, security clearance processes for the embassy uh, before uh, onboarding all the eight interns. So in total, we had two uh, interns for the executive office. We had two for the FMO office. And then we had one each for the EG, HR, health office, and program offices. So in total, uh, we had eight interns. So unlike the traditional norm, our uh, web programs are led uh, by the technical offices. Uh, the USA Zimbabwe Intention Program is actually administered uh, by the executive office. And these are some of the roles uh, which the executive office does uh, as part of this activity. So I will not go through them uh, for the sake of time. Uh, but... I would love to mention some additional learning and support activities, which we extended also uh, to the interns. So like in addition to the on-job learning, uh, the mission is offering bi-weekly learning series uh, to the interns where they are learning from professionals uh, within USAID, within the entire uh, embassy uh, community, as well as uh, other professionals from outside the workplace as well. So they network with professionals and leaders uh, and other interns as well from other organizations uh, uh, and from our network uh, of partners. So they also receive regular feedback on their work uh, via monthly feedback and evaluation sessions uh, through the internship supervisor and the executive officer. Uh, so these sessions, they just provide insights uh, to help them improve their skills and advance uh, their careers uh, within the mission. Him. So on the other hand, uh, these are the responsibilities of the implementing partner uh, as well. So we just try to adopt a continuous learning approach. And some of the things uh, we had to learn the hard way uh, uh, as we progressed uh, with the internship. Uh, for example, when we initially onboarded the in interns, uh, we hadn't thought of uh, like travel, like they would want to go on field visits and everything. We forgot all that stuff. And then along the way, as we were seeking ways to improve uh, the internship program, uh, we just realized we had forgotten these critical things. But again, uh, we had to find a work around working with the interns, their ideas with the implementing partner, and we managed to come up with the solution. And right now, uh, each one of them has been to at least a trip, one field trip, and they continue to go on field trips. Yeah. So these are some of the outcomes as well uh, and lessons uh, from this internship program. And of these outcomes, I would like to focus uh, more on the last two. So this program did not only create opportunities for young people, uh, but it also contributed to the mission's FSN empowerment efforts. So from the program, we had at least eight FSNs in non-supervisory roles uh, being afforded the opportunity to attain supervisory experience uh, through supervising uh, these eight interns. So additionally, uh, 
we got to learn more about the needs of young people uh, through direct interactions uh, with the youth. Uh, so one thing we learned is that uh, the program made us realize that as a mission, I don't know about other missions, but for USA Zimbabwe, uh, we, didn't, we do not uh, provide any pathways to entry for young professionals with no experience. Uh, so most of the opportunities available are not for fresh graduates, but they need experienced professionals. And uh, from this program, from the contribution of the interns, uh, the mission uh, has begun now having conversations along these lines to say, how can you accommodate young people? How can you create pathways for entry uh, for them to have successful careers uh, with USA and Zimbabwe? So... Finally, uh, we also uh, developed a toolkit for the internship, uh, which we believe other missions seeking to implement similar programs can also learn from uh, and also contribute uh, to make it even much better. So the toolkit generally points uh, to the resources uh, we've used to get to where we are today uh, and are available to share any more insights with anyone uh, probably interested uh, in implementing such a program. No. So one last uh, important thing to note is that we did not design a program and just impose everything on the interns. Uh, we, however, made a deliberate effort to uh, put the interns in the driver's seat and let them shape what they deem to be an ideal intention. So on top of proposing several changes uh, to our current stop, uh, scope, uh, the interns actually designed uh, the next phase of the internship program for the mission. Uh, so that's making a huge impact uh, on our PYD approach. And we continue to learn from them uh, as we move along. So with that, uh, I would like to hand over to Mishek, uh, one of our interns in the Human Resources Office, uh, for you to hear straight uh, from the youth's voices uh, and uh, their experience with this internship program. So over to you, Bishop. Thank you very much, Oshe, uh, for, for the presentation. And I greet you all, and I want to thank you for coming. The internship program has been a unique opportunity for myself in terms of personal experience. Ideally, myself, I have been having grown from an orphanage system and having no one to really take care of you and understand you from the perception. The world today has become a world whereby individuals is always who knows who and um, are you linked to someone? So I believed that the internship program, even through the selection process, has been an opportunity to also understand how a fair and a unique process is. Because nowadays, I believe people is all about money and bribery in some sections. From a, from a personal experience and exposure, I have had the opportunity to network, an opportunity to also work in a multicultural environment. And it is not always easy to come from nothing. It is not always easy to come also from the fire, from the ashes themselves. Uh, but the internship program has really shaped my life, and it, I believe also it has shaped the lives of my colleagues in order to determine the way and the future that they will partake. Ideally, when you live in Zimbabwe, you will understand that things did not come as easy as it is. Some of the youths have committed suicide because life has never been designed to be equal. And I also see the seclusion in our society. So the fact that the USAID Zimbabwe has come with this initiative for the first time as well, it has really impacted myself in terms of where I've been coming from. I've also grown to understand that sometimes there's also a glimpse of hope before you quit in this life. So that has been my experience as well. Others have said the sky is the limit, but with this internship program, I've seen that it is not the limit after all. You can actually make it, and the sour the life, the better it might be. 
and the mid the better it is going to be as well. I thank you. Thank you, Michel. Over to you. Thank you, Michel. Uh so in conclusion, uh I would like to just highlight the importance uh, of a supportive management and leaders who are open uh, to innovation and new ideas, without which uh, this intention would have never succeeded. Uh, so when we initiated this, uh, several questions were asked, like questions like, uh, this has never happened before in USA and Zimbabwe, and we've never had interns, how feasible is this? Uh, yeah, and questions like, okay, programs generally are for technical offices, things like that. But here we are today um, with the support uh, of our mission management. So in this, this last slide here, uh, that's our mission director, uh, Janine Davis, uh, with six uh, of the interns. So with that, uh, thank you so much. And over to you, Monica. Thank you. Thank you, Vusha. The work you're doing in Zimbabwe is, well, particularly with the internship program, right, is incredibly interesting. We heard it firsthand, right, from Meshek and his experience. So thank you both for sharing these thoughtful reflections with us today. Now we go to the Balkans to hear from Tara Kalapudi, the Youth Advisor for USAID North Macedonia Mission. Tara is an expert in child and youth protection, migration, and emergency preparedness and response, and has worked extensively in humanitarian context. Welcome, Tara. The stage is yours. Thank you very much, Monica. I am flattered to be here today, and it's so exciting to see that we have young people joining from all over the world. It's nice to meet you, all of you. Amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, so today I'm here to speak about how we implement the positive youth development approach in our mission in North Macedonia. Let me first say a few words about youth in North Macedonia. They uh, certainly face big challenges like few good job opportunities, high unemployment rates, skills mismatches, corruption, etc. They also have limited chances for civic engagement. Actually, a few days ago, there was a research that said that 80% of young people stated that they're inactive. The government, unfortunately, has focused more on politics than citizens' needs, and issues like corruption and poor environmental standards are pushing young people away to emigrate. Nearly half of the youth want to leave for better job opportunities and living conditions. And an indicator for that is that in 2023, about 18% of the population was youth, which is a 6% decrease compared to the previous year, or that's 70,000 young people. And for a country of barely 2 million, 70,000 people is quite a lot. Well, USAID North Macedonia knows that working with youth is a strategic imperative, as we stressed out many times until now, and that youth are the now, not only the future, and that to solve the issues impacting the country, power will need to shift into the hands and the hearts of young people. So what did USA do about it? In fact, we recognized all of the issues that I talked about in the beginning, and we entrained uh, uh, youth's contributions to society into development, into our CDCS. We have a special development uh, objective uh, dedicated to youth. We also have some youth-focused programs, one of which is Youth Actively Create Opportunities a program that runs for five years until January 2028 and is implemented by improving economies for stronger communities in a budget of $10 million. Can you please go to the next slide? Okay, thank you very much. So you might be asking, how do we implement a positive youth development approach? Well, we tried to do that from the very beginning. Uh, design and creation of the youth actively uh, create opportunities. Youth were a critical part of all of these processes that are here, not just as participants, but as co-creators. They were mapping, for example, the youth champions and organizations in North Macedonia, making sure that marginalized and underrepresented groups are all, always included in the process. They were also co-leading focus groups with youth-led and youth-serving organizations and other relevant stakeholders like media, startups, private sector, etc. Some of these pro processes required mentorship, but many of them actually didn't. At the end, when everything was ready and set to go, 
the program identified three key components, partnerships to support economic opportunities, competencies and skills for jobs, progressive careers and civic life, and values for civic engagement. Can you please go to the next slide? Okay, this is the most important slide. How do we practice what we preach? Well, I divided this slide into three steps, preparation, action, and next steps. And action, I have to say, is the most exciting one. So in the preparation process, we made sure that we reviewed all the PYD materials, trainings, we did research about best activities, and then we sat down together with the implementing partner and reflected of, uh, after one year of implementation, how much did we incorporate PYD into our implement, uh, implementation? We did this reflection individually, but we also did it as part of a team. And then we invited relevant stakeholders and thought about the process with themselves. But remember, in order for, for example, the ministries and other relevant stakeholders to be able to say to us how much we implemented PYD, they have to know what it is. So I'll speak about that at the end. Uh, when it comes to the action itself, I decided to uh, make uh, to talk about this uh, through the four key components of PYD, which is assets, agency, contribution, and en enabling environment. Remember that assets are the positive qualities and skills that young people bring, emphasizing their strengths in their surroundings. Here we had numerous trainings, and the focus was to ensure that the training sessions align with what young people express that they need in the research that the activity conducted on youth career and skills aspirations. This was, by the way, a countrywide and youth-led research, as well as those collected during initiatives in the field. Examples include technical trainings and soft skills trainings like 3D printing, scanning and modeling, social entrepreneurship, freelancing, which was a very uh, one that everyone liked, culinary trainings, PLC programming, and when it comes to soft skills, communications, teamwork, leadership, how to position yourself during interview, how to negotiate the salary, for example, etc. Here, we also supported acceleration programs for young entrepreneurs and startups. And how did we do this? We did it through memorandums of understanding with universi universities, but also with student assemblies. Let's go over to agency or empowering young people to be actors of change through exercising the skills that they acquired through assets, remember. So we practice this through hiring students instead of professional companies. For example, students of graphic design painted the office of the activity. Students of English always provide translation on our events. Students of videography film during our events, even when the ambassador comes. Students of architecture, for example, project offices of the Career Center and the Center for Social Entrepreneurship that, you, that USAID will support with equipment, equipment in the largest university, etc. By engaging in these opportunities, youth are encouraged to exercise decision-making, assume responsibilities, and navigate both successes and challenges. These experiences, you have to agree, are crucial, as they not only build competence and confidence, but they also instill a sense of responsibility. Talking about contribution, or the active engagement of youth and community development while fostering a sense of responsibility and connection. Well, for example, remember I told you about a, a, a youth-led countrywide research on youth career inspiration. This informed our programming and policy, but not only ours, actually the government used this policy to inform their decisions and strategic objectives. Youth-led civic action activities through peer-to-peer -peer mentorship in the youth engagement clubs. We have around 10 across the country. Youth also developed the curricula and communication strategy for the Career Center. And this was the first time that something like this happened at the university. Everybody was very excited, uh, excited and it was very, very successful. Youth were also supporting local municipal councils when they were established with the new uh, youth law, etc. And the fourth key component is enabling environment or supportive, resourceful and posit positive environment, crucial uh, in achieving su successful development outcomes. Youth, for example, developed a strategy for functioning of the career center of the University in Macedonia, where they developed the communication strategy and plan from the, uh, for the promotion of the operational measures of the Ministry of Labor and Social Policy. This was a great success. All they did was um, huge uh, reach out through the social media, and all of a sudden, in just one day, 
all of the places of the open call to join for uh, to apply for an employment opportunity was filled. They also organized speed dating events with companies and students for internships and job placements. They also created youth-friendly policies under mentorship at working places and the government, etc. So because we're seeing so many positive results and because we're so much recognized by the government and other stakeholders of how much we implement the positive youth development approach and how much we work together with youth, we were thinking, what are some of the next steps? How do we make this even more sustainable? So uh, similar, similarly as Rwanda, we are going to train all USAID's activities in the mission uh, and our implementing partners in PYD, but we're also going to train together with the government and stakeholders, the new government, because we just had a change in government and ministries in North Macedonia. So together with them, we're, we're going to train them in positive youth development. I hope that you were inspired by this as much as I was inspired by the other talks. Thank you very much. And Monica, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. It was a very insightful to hear about the actual steps that you're taking to ensure the programs and initiatives that you lead in the USA North Macedonia mission have a positive youth development approach. Um, well, now we move on to the part of the program that's closest to my heart. I have been a YP2LE partner for the past two years. And working with the YP2LE team has really left an impression on me. For those of you who don't know, YP2LE is celebrating five years of providing information and tools needed to develop high quality, impactful, and sustainable youth programs. These tools include the project design guide for youth inclusive agriculture and food systems, the integrated mental, mental health and psychosocial support toolkit, the Youth and Gender Analysis Toolkit, and the Positive Youth Development Starter Kit. YP2LE also partners directly with young people from the Youth Advisor Group to the Digital Youth Council. We, young people, have been a part of YP2LE and its predecessor, Youth Power Learning, since their inception. To learn more about the experiences of young leaders and what their engagement has looked like, Let's move on to our next session, Youth at the Forefront. And before we start, just keep an eye on all the resources that are being shared in the chat, which all of them include the, the ones that I just mentioned. Um, well, uh, yeah, so Kevin, let's jump on to this next uh, session. Uh, the, Kevin was Digital Youth Council member for Indonesia, and he is the founding president of Hashtag We Are Enough, a social movement organization in Indonesia committed to anti-bullying through educational discussions, information campaigns, and special projects based on social media. Kevin, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Hi. Hi, everyone. It was a pleasure to me to be here and accompanied by my fellow youths over here. And I'm so happy to be here and to be uh, to be moderating these sessions. As Monica said, my name is Kevin Denisito Srega. You can call me Kevin. I'm from Indonesia. And I'll be moderating our next session uh, as we ask USA youth partners from the Digital Youth Councils and the Youth at the Youth Lead Ambassador Program about their experiences. So we also get the insights into what they would like to see in the future for youth partnerships in international development. So I'm going to ask our three uh, panelists to introduce themselves and tell us how they have worked with the YP2LE and USAID. Let's start with Abimbola. I was about to say, don't jinx it. Don't start with me, but okay, yeah. <laughs> So my name is Abimbola and um, Abimbola Ajala, and I have been a youth ambassador and also a PM advisor. So uh, yeah, those are two, my two amazing roles. Um, I think that my experience um, was eye-opening, right? Being a youth ambassador um, goes beyond the name right it's a lot about the heart that you carry for the work that you do right so having engagements coming on webinars was just a lot it helped me to see my work beyond just 
what I do in Nigeria, but to now scale it. I began to think scalability, sustainability, and then now having to be a peer ambassador to amazing, intelligent people from different parts of the world was just mind blowing. Like they talk and you're like, I think I should start my PhD thesis with these guys. You know, they are just amazing. So it was, it was very insightful. It was enlightening and it fostered a lot of collaboration and partnership between all of us. That's so interesting. Thank you, Amibola. Udi? Um, so you are still mute. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank yeah. you, Jeff. I'm so sorry. So, uh, no problem. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. So that's a pleasure for me to be speaking to this very important event. Uh, again, my name is Udi. Just, I'm based in IT. I am an economist with the concentration natural resources environment and so on. The energy I'm a climate activist, and for instance, uh, last year, I had the opportunity to be selected as one of the COP28 in our show delegate to participate at COP28 to advocate for youth participation and education in decision-making regarding climate change. So that's again a pleasure for me to be here to share my experience with the uh, PGLE. With so I was a youth lead ambassador in this program, and that was a very interesting program for me. And during this program, I had the opportunity to work with my uh, ambassador and, and joke with on she's based in Cameroon, and we had a project together, and that was a project on youth, biodiversity, and climate. It, I can say that that was a very uh, important program for me. So during that program, I had the opportunity to, to, uh, to let, I mean, to uh, have a, have a bigger network, I can say that, and to exchange with my peers and also to get new knowledge, either I'm as youth ambassador, but also as a young leader in art. I mean, acting in my community to bring changes in my community. So I think that um, in some minutes, you will know more about me, and that's a pleasure for me to briefly introduce myself. Thank you very much. Thank you, Udi, for your, for bringing us to the next person. So last but not least, over to you, Rashida. Yay! Hi, everyone. Nice seeing um, you and uh, lovely matching color with the um, Dibola. Um, so this is Rashida connecting from Morocco. Um, I'm on a mission to assist individuals with a focus um, with you to be active citizens in their communities. Um, especially focusing on um, Africa. And uh, I have joined the team as a Digital Youth Council member uh, along with Kevin, and it has been an amazing 12 months um, of great work and learning experience with interesting um, and inspiring young leaders to reduce um, digital harm for children and youth. Um, it has been an incredible journey in advising um, USA digital strategy, focusing on creating um, safer digital spaces. And not only that, but also we ended up um, recommending and working on potential projects, which I'll be sharing with you about um, in the coming minutes. Thank you so much, Rashida. And also, we were part of the USA Digital Youth Council. Thank you so much all for joining us today. So let us start our session. So in addition to International Youth Day, so we are all celebrating five years of YP2LE and it's focused on positive youth deployment, right? So tell us about your experience with the USAID and YP2LE and what you will take away from your experience. Maybe I will start from Abimpula. Um, my experience is was very much a learning one, right? You have the tools at your disposal. You have the people, the intelligent minds, the change makers at your disposal. Now it's how you can use them, basically. And I had to learn that in my journey here. Um, it was every every pretty much every subject you wanted you had a resource on it pretty much there was somebody working in a particular sector that you needed that could answer your questions um and that for me was just really it was 
a, a, a it, it's like a bank. It's a resource bank that we have here. A bank where everything that you needed, people, resources you could get. So I, I think it was it was really insightful and a learning process for me. My sister, like I like to call her from South Africa, we had to partner on a period property project. And this is me in Nigeria. This is somebody in South Africa. So it was we had to come together. And it wasn't it wasn't something that um youth lead mandated us to do it was just our common interest that brought us together and then she made sure that i got on tv on south Af in south africa like it was just really amazing and mind-blowing so the people the resources that you have at your disposal and how you can make use of them right how you can use that for the work that you do i am an education advocate right so i get children from marginalized communities into schools at no cost to themselves how you can scale that work like i said earlier and sustain that work with the resources and the people that you have that's what um youth power has provided and i'm very thankful for it that's so cool Abimbola. and what do you think woody for that Thank you again. Thank you again. Uh, from my experience as a youth leader in Dallas, so first of all, I want to tell you what I was with for Crush. It's program, and that experience brought me uh, what values to me in working, extension with my peers, and also capacity building. First, doing my own, I was a valued member of a global community of United. Uh, Starters. This experience has led me to share my social impacts, work with a bigger audience as a change maker. And also, I worked with my PN Ambassador in Cameroon, as I've mentioned at the beginning. Uh, and we conducted a project of a leadership project of youth diversity and climate. Then I joined a multicultural team, shared and learned both I mean more about other ambassador achievements. And I grew my professional network allowed me to meet and collaborate with young leaders from around the world. Last, please, during this program, so we had some plenary sessions and insights that I received from the experts and the station helped me to take effective actions to tackle global crisis. For instance, as of nation, after my leadership project uh, in climate change, as youth leader ambassador, I participated at COP28 as one of the 100 COP28 international climate delegates selected out of more than 11,000 of applicants all over the world. And I was the only Asian in this program. And that was a pleasure for me. That was a pride for me to represent my country, Haiti. And I can say that that the insight, the knowledge that, that from this program as youth leader ambassador who helped me to achieve uh, this, I mean, to achieve that, to, pa to participate at COP. Because uh, during my application, I, by, I mean, when I was, when I had to apply uh, to this opportunity, that the insight, the input that I've received from this program to help me to achieve this great opportunity. And that was a great opportunity. That was a great experience uh, as you feel ambassador in the Thank you. Kevin, oh, I'm so sorry that Kevin's not here anymore. Okay, you got back. Great. I am so sorry about the connections issue. We know that the technology connects us, but it's also one of the problems. But I'm sorry about that. But I heard uh, what I heard from Abimbola and Woody, both of you have the same similar experiences from the exposures and also the people that you guys connect with. That's so amazing. And what do you think that she's as part of our movement together? <laughs> I think there is a lot of similarities with other USA than y YP2LE activities because I can tell that um, I get along with um, uh, the knowledge gained and the experiences and the skills that uh, Woody and, and Birbola also uh, shared. Maybe one of the things um, that I'd like to add besides what they added is that it was a pleasure to um, not only share and represent Morocco, but also um, spotlight on the strategies adopted 
the challenges face, that young people and adolescents face, um, as well as uh, lesson learned and success stories um, that would benefit um, your said digital strategy and even our future project as um, Digital Youth Council members. Um, and beside the great network and the diversity of the people in the room from all diverse countries and the exchange that we had even from um, other neighborhood uh, regions, I think it was um, really interesting to highlight the part of mentorship and the doorways of opportunities that um, these activities has provided. Of course, there is the gain of confidence and trust to keep going um, despite the challenges that we face. Um, but also it was a push um, uh, to, to, to apply these, pro these skills learned um, and also the, the knowledge gained in our current and future uh, projects. Um, on a good note, um, many of us, I believe, tried to keep this um, experience sustainable. Uh, from my experience, um, my participation um, with the Youth Council has um, led me to be uh, selected as one of the fellows for the ITU's Generation Connect Youth Leadership Program, which I encourage everyone to apply for um, in the coming year. And if you'd like to know more about it, feel free to connect with me. And within this fellowship, um, I'm able to receive funding so I can apply and implement this um, digital uh, project. And definitely this is also thanks um, to um, USAID and uh, YP2LE uh, space, an opportunity to keep going and to implement my idea. That's super cool, especially, I think one thing that I can take from all of you guys, it's more about how impactful this program is for you guys. So going to the second questions, so we know that you all you all have made impact on your community, right? Through your work in so many ways. And why is it important for you to be partners in international development work? So I believe I will start these questions and over to you, Woody. What do you think? Thank you again, Kevin. That's a pleasure. So I want to start by saying that future belongs to youth. To answer this question, I want you to understand it. And I believe that youth must be the standard of any development activity to participate in the Southern American regarding their future. Because today we are celebrating uh, International Youth Day. You know what? 30 years after, 40 years after, 50 years after, we who are here today what we dare own. That's your children. That's the next generation who are going to be in your position. And we should create for them a space to live. A better right. Because they don't deserve to live in a world which is destroyed by for climate change. And I'm sure that you love your children. You love the next generation. You want to create for them better schools. So, if effectively you love them, if you want to create for them a better place, I encourage you all who are listening to me now to act sustainably. So, if we are conducting activities, international development activities, we have to consider the next generation. If effectively what we are doing today, if they are like important for the next generation, how are, are you doing it for us or are we doing it for the next generation? So to conclude, I'll to tell you again, if you love first for today in that way, if you love the next generation, you have to have sustainable Thank you. That's my advice to you. Thank you. That's so cool. Intergen intergenerational mobility. What do you think uh, for you, Abimbola? Um, I'm going to be, um, I'm going to answer your question with a question first and say, why not? <laughs> if not now, when? Okay. Um, this is the time to involve youths. It's not, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be a debate anymore. 
right? We have the numbers, we have the skills, we have the the lingua, right? We have the creativity. And yesterday on my LinkedIn, I was saying that the Olympics, for example, that showed us, you know, look at the team Stroud, the young people, the 19 year olds, you know, just young people showing what they can do with their skills. So why not involve them in international development now, right? We, we are not an afterthought of solutions that concern us. And we need to be very conscious of that. So whether international development, whether international organizations want to partner now, it's, it's, I say, I dare say it's common sense <laughs> that you bring young people, you know, I also like this quotes from the MasterCard Foundation CEO. And then our, our premise was by 2035, Africa will have, I'm using Africa for contest to so have the largest and youngest workforce globally. Now, that is not a challenge. That is something we should tap into. That is why we need to strengthen our resolve to see that when we're building a project or whatever it is that we're doing internationally, that we involve the youth that con that the solutions concern so that we can build not something. I, I'm sorry, I don't want to see the youth being a tick in the paragraph for your big um, presentation. Or oh, let's put the youth, let's put a number of what we have done for the youth in a big presentation to look cool. No, we're not a tick in the box. We need to be involved throughout. We understand what is going on, right? I can't provide a yep. solution to somebody as a doctor or whatever to something or an experience I've not been part of. Let the people that understand the solution be part of it thank you that's so cool Bimbola. we need to be part of it so why not now it's supposed to be now solutions and now over to you rashida what do you think <laughs> i think that um there should be a time and a time soon to ask the question how can we improve um youth involvement in international development work and eventually we as youth, um, we trust that we are able to bring fresh perspectives and innovative solutions that often lead to more effective and forward thinking outcomes. Um, we are adaptable to these new technologies, which allow them to leverage these digital tools for um, advocacy, for mobilization, and many other things that um, we discover once we uh, join hand in head collaboratively. Um, we also represent a significant portion of the population and um, excluding us from this co-collaboration co would, um, would mean sidelining a large um, and essential segment of society. Um, as the leader of today and tomorrow, our engagement today lays the ground for informed and inclusive leadership um, in the future so we can ensure um, sustainability. Another point very quickly that involving us in, de in development work provide us with opportunities for skills development and empowerment, mm -hmm. enabling us to take ownership of um, the process and outcomes and because we're hopeful, um, we keep going and we ask for the international community to be with us and also other stakeholders. And if we weren't hopeful, we wouldn't wake up every morning and fight um, for a seat table with everyone else in the room. Thank you so much, Rashida. That will be one of my quotes today. It's forward thinking outcomes. So this is this is as the last questions for this sections. I will ask, especially there are some young people from the comment sections asking about these questions as well. So are there any approaches uh, that you would recommend for reaching marginalized youth that you think development actors are missing? So for example, one question in the comment section say that are these any youth activists actively seeking and encouraging the participant for youth with disabilities? and any marginal uh, actors out there. So I will start these questions again, and by Rashida, you can go. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
eventually to effectively reach marginalized youth, um, development actors should collaboratively consider um, several key strategies. Um, first, it's really important to partner with local organizations and community leaders who have um, established trust with, this, with, with youth to ensure outreach efforts and um, culturally sensitive um, and relevant. Um, another thing would be utilizing um, technology in a way that is inclusive to everyone. So it can provide accessible resources um, and support um, tailored um, to everyone. It is also important to um, design inclusive programs that address physical, financial, and social barriers and with marginalized youth for marginalized youth in um, co-creation processes that allow their perspectives um, to shape the solution affecting them. Another point, it's really important to address um, intersectional challenges because um, like such how uh, gender and socioeconomic status intersex, uh, intersect with um, marginalization because like this, we will ensure um, comprehensive support we would create safe spaces um, where youth feel secured and valued foster engagement. And looking and managing things from an intersectional lens, which requires us to reach the furthest behind first, achieve inclusive and um, responsive policy making and um, service delivery. Um, Got it. Thank you so much, Sashida. That's so cool. And maybe within within a short time uh, we have now, uh, how about how about Woody? What do you think? Uh, can you give it and keep it short for these questions? Very short. So I totally agree uh, with Sashida. And what I will uh, have from my experience in working with uh, the enabled jokes, I can say that the appropriate approach as Nashida said, is to implicate them in local and community active areas so that they can bring solutions to the community to become a new generation of leaders rather than groups. Because if we are promoting equity for a just transition, these people, these marginalized youth, they should be or they must be getting a can change in their lives as human beings. Otherwise, this is not a just transition because no one should be left yet. Thank you. That's so cool. The last, last but not least, for Abimbola. This is the last part of this. Yeah. So, to make it very simple, I'll piggyback what um, both of my panelists have said. The COVID um, pandemic has taught us that we cannot afford not to localize our projects. Right, we cannot take our projects from up down. It has to go from down up to the most to the most bad marginalized to the grassroots. So we need to make sure that we are we have constant grassroots community engagement. It's important. We it's not just about the report or what we want to put out in our newsletters, is that the people most affected by certain concerns. Um Rashida talked on technology. There are areas across Africa that have not seen electricity, right? Those are concerns that we should look at. And that will lead me to my last point, which is we cannot deal with issues in isolation. We have to look at issues holistically. When I shot a documentary on period poverty, it was imperative for me to shoot that documentary because I wanted people to see period poverty as not just giving parts to young girls. There are waste disposal issues, there are, san there are sanitization issues, there are communities without good um, toilets and stuff. Those are issues I wanted to bring to the forefront. So we cannot address issues in isolation. We have to look at it holistically to give the solutions that are required. Thanks. Thank you so much, Abimbola. I agree with all of you guys. It's now time for us as a youth to be part of the solutions and be the movement. So this was a fantastic session. I want to thank all panel members for their insights. I'd like to also thank YP20 and USAID for their continued partnerships. So back to you, Monica. 
Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, Thanks. Woody, Rashida, Amipola. Thank you for framing so beautifully what your experience has been. As I listen to each of you, there's one phrase I kept in mind, which is nothing for you without you, nothing for us without us. You all made some great points and recommendations on this regard. So thanks a lot for your inspiring contribution. So a theme throughout today's event is the role of youth champions as mentors, advocates, and partners to help us achieve our goals. We are reaching the end of our event. Thus, I am pleased to introduce our final speaker, Bama Astreya. Bama currently serves as the Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Gender Equality and Women's Empowerment Hub and the Inclusive Development Hub in USAID's Bureau for Inclusive Growth, Partnerships, and Innovation. She is an expert on international la labor issues, gender and social inclusion, and business and human rights. She is also a longtime champion for youth. Welcome, Deputy Assistant Administrator. Over to you. Thank you so much. And I know we're already a few minutes over time for this webinar. So I am really just going to take this minute to appreciate the team. Uh, there was so much effort that went behind this webinar to bringing all of these amazing speakers together, to allowing us to hear and learn from your experience. And we appreciate each and every one of the people that um, helped to make this a success today. Happy International Youth Day to everyone. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Assistant Administrator. Um, we've reached the end of our program, and I hope that, like you, you all enjoyed hearing from such a diverse group of youth and youth champions. I live here today really feeling inspired, and I hope you all do as well. Thank you so much for joining us today.